What's up, AP Psych? Welcome back. So this is our fifth video on our Unit 4, Sensation and Perception. We finished all of our, um, going over all of our senses and our sensation and the way we bring in physical stimuli and information. And now we're getting into the perception piece. We're going to talk about how we interpret and organize that stimuli as it comes into our body so that we can perceive and understand the world around us. So we'll get started from there. A lot about what we're going to talk about here today is... Um, embedded in something we call like a nature nurture debate. And there's a question surrounding perception, like, you know, are we born with the ability to perceive or does it develop as we grow, right? Are we born with it, nature, or do things change? We perceive things differently as we develop and are exposed to our environment, which is nurture. So we have a couple points about this. First, or a few studies. Uh, there's this restored vision study that was done in 1932. And they took um, adults who had been blind since birth um, because they had cataracts that had developed and they were able to um, fix those cataracts, remove the cataracts and they regained sight. But what they found was that once those individuals regained sight, they could differentiate things like figure and ground, like what's in the foreground of an image, what's in the background and things like that. Um, but they had difficulty discriminating things like shapes. They couldn't tell the difference between the circle and this triangle. And that's because they'd never seen those things before because they had been blind since birth. They'd never perceived these images. So what they saw was just a, a landscape of muddled colors and figures that they couldn't name, right? But interestingly, if you handed someone like a ball in a circle and they were able to feel it out, they could name it. But if you held it out in front of them, they were just looking at it. They couldn't tell you what it was because they'd had no experience with that. They'd had no visual perception in their lives. And so they'd never been exposed to shapes, lines, edges. They didn't have those feature detectors in their brain. It was going to take some time to develop those. So we know from that um, experiment, that study, that research, that there is some nurture aspect to developing perception. Another example. If you ever heard of the, the term sensory deprivation, they're kind of popular. This is an image down here of sensory deprivation tanks. People can go in there to, um, to think um, and just kind of relax and, and take a break from the world. But there's a study in 1970 where these kittens were born and they raised these kittens in these environments that only had vertical lines. They had absolutely no exposure to horizontal lines. And so when they were removed from that environment, after a certain period of time, they could not perceive horizontal lines um, because their brain had never seen them before. Their eyes had never seen them. They had no reason to believe that those even existed in the world. So it made it very difficult. And they would run into things that were horizontal. Um, if you played with them with a toy that was vertical, for example, sorry, I'm sitting in the sun here. Let me fix this. So if you showed these kittens a toy that was vertical, let's say this phone is like a kitten toy, right? And I turned it vertically. Um, they would play with it, they'd hit it, they'd tap it, but the moment it was turned horizontal, they wouldn't even perceive it. They wouldn't know what to do with it. They'd never seen anything like that before. So it's almost like their brain wasn't processing the information that was coming in. So it's a really interesting thing about perception is that we do develop perception over time because of these things that we're exposed to. Another example here, there's something called perceptual adaptation. So we talked about sensory adaptation Perceptual adaptation is our visual ability to adjust to an artificially displaced visual field. You're going to experience this in our um, Perception Olympics, if you haven't done that already. Uh, we'll get some per, uh, perception goggles out. But if you've gone to um, driving school, they may have also had you put on things like drunk goggles in driving school. And it totally changes your field of vision. And you have to adapt to that. This man here has goggles on that turns his world upside down. So he's trying to shake this man's hand, but he's going to the completely wrong place because his world's been flipped. Um, the interesting thing about that as humans, we can adapt to that upside down world. After a few minutes, um, he's gonna figure out where things are and where his hand should be. And his brain is going to adapt and it's gonna make sense of that world. Interestingly, after his brain has adapted and he makes sense of it, if he takes these goggles off, it's going to flip his world back upside down because his brain adapted. He's going to have to readapt again to not wearing the goggles. So that's perceptual adaptation. We can adjust um, to differences in our perception over time. 
So part of this um, and the reason that we have, you know, ideas and expectations about what we're going to perceive is because of something called a perceptual set. This is a mental predisposition to perceive one thing and not another. And again, this is because of our experiences and our expectations. So this should be keying you into something we talked about earlier with sensation, thinking top down processing. We're using our past experiences and our expectations to help per perceive the world around us. So usually our perceptual sets lead us to fairly accurate conclusions. You know, we make sense of the world, shortcuts, mental shortcuts on what we expect to see, but sometimes they can lead us astray um, if we are you know, our perceptual set is incorrect or our top-down processing doesn't work the way we expect it to, and we might miss something. Um, or, for example, if you believe in the Loch Ness Monster and you go to Loch Ness to see it, this image down here is a famous image that many people claim to be evidence of the Loch Ness Monster, um, and others say, no, that's just a funky-shaped tree trunk in Loch Ness in Scotland, right? And depending on um, your thoughts on aliens, flying saucers, UFOs, if you look at this image, many of us are going to say, oh, those are just clouds. But if you ask one of those UFO experts or conspiracy theorists, um, they might say, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a UFO in the sky. That's evidence of flying saucers of extraterrestrial activity. So it all depends on your perceptual set and your predisposition to perceive certain things and not others. All right, so what determines our perceptual set? As we grow, and we'll talk more about this in our development unit, but we um, organize and create things called schemas. And these are concepts, like I said, that organize and interpret unfamiliar information. So as we learn things, as we develop, and we bring in new sensations, um, we perceive new things, we organize those things in our brain. So for example, this little girl down here, she sees a dog for the first time, right? And her parents say, doggy. Right? So this is a doggy. So she creates a schema for, oh, this animal is a dog. But she hasn't experienced other animals yet either. And she sees a cat. And then she says, doggy to the cat. Maybe you've experienced this with, with little kids. They call the same animal. They call animals by the same name. Or they call um, similar things by the same name because they don't know how to differentiate them yet. They haven't created schemas in their head. So then you have dad explaining to her the difference between dogs and cats. Now she's accommodated and created a new schema in her mind to interpret that information correctly the next time. Uh, so those things develop through experience as we grow, right? Our schemas, we have more and we add to them as we develop. In addition to our um, perceptual sets that we already have, there are certain things that can impact the way we perceive situations. And one of the biggest things that impacts the way we perceive is the context of a given situation. Right? A given stimulus can evoke radically different perceptions based on the immediate context of the stimulus. Right, Context matters in every situation. We talk about it in history class. We talk about it in English class. Context is important for you to understand what's really happening. So here are some examples. Context can influence how you see shapes. So these blue circles here are identical, but the second one looks bigger because of the circles we placed around it, the context that's around it. And that kind of plays a trick on your mind. Okay? Context can influence how you recognize objects, right? In this word, the, this shape is an H, but over here, cat becomes an A, right? Here, Serena Williams, she seems like she may be conveying anger. She's upset, screaming at someone, but the full context of the image, you see she's celebrating. She's just won a point, right? She's excited, something like that. So without the full context or understanding the context of a situation, you could misperceive something or perceive it incorrectly. In addition to context effects, one of the biggest ones for humans, oh, well, here's another example real quick. Um, there's something called the moon illusion. If you've ever seen the moon when it's close to the horizon and you think, man, that moon, we have a huge moon tonight, right? It's massive. And then when the moon gets up in the sky, it looks smaller. Okay. In reality, those moons are the same size, right? They're the same size in the sky. The only difference is you have context to compare it to with the horizon. You can see buildings, you can see trees, you can see land and realize how big the moon is. When it's up in the sky, there's nothing to compare it to. There's no sizes to compare it to. So we call that the moon illusion 
um, which is another context effect. Another example of context effect is cultural context. Um, this is instilled by our culture and it alters our perceptions. So this is a classic study here. Um, they showed this image to different cultures and groups of people. Um, nearly all East Africans who were questioned about this image said that the seated woman here was balancing a metal box on her head. And the family here, they said, was sitting underneath a tree, right? Because that's the context from which they come. Those are cultural expectations and the way their culture perceives different things. So if we would show this to people in a Western society, what might you say? Think about that for a second, right? Hopefully you're thinking, oh, I mean, this woman's just sitting beneath a window. Right? And this family over here is, this is a pillar of some kind that may be holding up a house or a building or wherever they're at, right? But different cultural upbringings instill different contexts and different ways to perceive information. Now, knowing that, there is a field of psychology that developed around something called human factors. Okay? And that's a human factor psychologist. Human factor psychologists work to apply principles of psychology to designing products and creating work environments that boost productivity and minimize safety issues. So they spend much of their time performing research and applying what they know about human behavior, perception, cognition, to create more usable products and work environments that work better for individual people. Okay, So you have your human factor considerations. They're mostly worried about one to one person interfacing with a certain device or one person interfacing with their workstation, right? They're focused on one person and how they interact with products. Um, that's different than industrial and organizational psychologists who focus on how people interact in their work groups, in their work teams, and with their company, right? So it's uh, it's more individually focused as human factors. So their users, the use environment, and their design interface. And hopefully their goal is designing something that's safe and effective. So we'll see a couple examples here. All right, when you think about cars that you drive, many of you have your, have your license or are working on getting it. Um, car dashboards have developed quite a bit over time. And you can you have human factor psychologists to thank for that. You know, at the beginning you had these speedometers and things like that, kind of hard to read, kind of hard to tell exactly where you were, how fast you're going, uh, or how much exactly how much gas you had left. And you know, things start to develop over time. Um, they can give you the number, it can give you more mileage data. And then today you have things like Tesla, which are almost fully digital, right? And they can tell you where your car is in your lane, exactly how much mile per hour you're going exactly where you are on the earth. Um, if you wanted to look up how much gas miles you had left, what your um, fuel efficiency was, how much oil life you had left in your car. Um, it's super easy with the dashboard, right? And human factor psychologists do a lot of work to make sure things are easy to work with and effective and safe so that people can continue improving and becoming more efficient. Another example, perception and human factors. Uh, you've probably never thought of psychologists playing a role in your um, stove at home, but old stoves, right? I have a stove that kind of sits like this, except the knobs are up top and it's super hard to tell. I always have to look and say, am I like turning on the right one? Half the time I turn on the wrong one because they're not really organized in a way that's helpful to know which one goes where, right? But here, this is one where a human factor psychologist has improved things because these are obviously these knobs go um, in the same structure as the stovetop, right? It's much easier to use um, and it's easier to understand. So human factor psychologists help us develop things like that. Uh, they also help us understand and design equipment that can avoid disaster, right? The, mo the more we know about human nature, the way humans make decisions and the way humans interact with products and tools, um, the, the safer they can make things, right? Two thirds of airline crashes are due to some type of human error, largely based on errors of perception. They misinterpret information coming from their instruments. They misinterpret information coming in about weather or flight patterns or things like that. And so human factor psychologists are always working to design and implement things that are easier, safer, and more effective to use. So that wraps up our um, perceptual interpretation notes. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions or anything like that, and we'll get on to perceptual organization. Thanks.